Today we're going to talk about drone law for educators, K through 12 schools and universities. This article is written primarily to help drone educators and schools understand the legal issues surrounding drones. So let's jump straight into drone law, guys. So one foundations of drone law. This is a quote from my book, Drones, There are Many Civilian Uses in the U.S. Laws Surrounding Them. The Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution gives Congress authority to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states. Congress created the Federal Aviation Agency by the Federal Aviation Act of 1958. But in 1967, Congress changed the name into the Federal Aviation Administration and moved that agency to the Department of Transportation, which is a presidential cabinet department. Yeah, so the FAA has been given by Congress jurisdiction to regulate navigable airspace of aircraft by regulation order. The FAA has created regulations known as the Federal Aviation Regulations, FARS, which govern the certification of only civil aircraft, civil pilot licensing, airspace, commercial operations, general piloting rules, pilot school, pilot schools and cert uh, certificated agencies, airports, and na uh, navigational facilities. So the FAA also regulates in multiple ways by creating advisory circulars or memos or interpretations on the regulations. Regulations are the law, while advisory circulars, memos, and interpretations are the FAA's opinion of how to follow the law, but they are not the law. However, they somewhat become law in effect because even though they are not the law, the interpretations change people's behavior who would rather not pay an attorney to defend them in a prosecution case. They, in effect, stay out of the gray area, like the guy in the yellow shirt in the graphic. He stays out of this gray area here. Uh, so when I say gray, I don't mean that it is, it's not clear as to whether it is the law or not. The, the gray area is not the law. But I mean that it is unclear as to whether a judge would agree with the FAA's opinion and would find the guy in the yellow shirt to be in violation of the regulations. In short, the law is what you get charged with violating, but the interpretations, memos, advisory circulars are what determine if you are on the FAA's hit list so they can go fishing to try and get you with the law, the regulations. So keep in mind the FAA has that super vague regulation which prohibits you from acting in a careless and reckless manner, which functionally acts as a giant catch-all. This gets uh, pretty much thrown in as a charge for almost every, every FAA prosecution out there. So out of the 23 FAA enforcement actions against drone operators I studied, all 23 of them were charged with violating 9113. Uh, keep in mind that 107.23, which is the 107 version of careless and reckless, was not around at the time. This is all like pre-107. So why are these regulations created? Well, they are really just safety standards that have uh, that have been prescribed by the FAA for us to follow to maintain the safety of the national airspace system. The FARs apply to almost everything that touches aviation. A good exercise is to find something that the FARs do not regulate. And below is a graph to help you understand the different areas that the FAA regulates, which all contribute to the safety of the national airspace system. So, how drones can legally fly. Unmanned aircraft can be flown as public aircraft under the public COA, uh, civil aircraft flown under a Section 333 exemption as non-recreational unmanned aircraft under Part 107 or under Part 101 as a recreational unmanned aircraft. The classification of the aircraft will determine which set of regulations and standards are used. Below is a graphical summary of the requirements of each of the different classifications. Purple is where the burden of determining the standards is placed upon the remote pilot in command. Gray is where the FAA determines the standards. So here's a helpful uh, breakdown of the four major areas that the schools could potentially fly under. We're going to go into each of those as why or why not the schools would want to fly under that particular type of approval from the FAA. Uh, based upon what the FAA has previously said or not said. So let's jump in. Public aircraft operations under a public certificate of authorization, a COA. Public aircraft are those that, one, fall into one of five statutorily defined owner-operated situations, are flown for a governmental purpose, and three, are not flying for a commercial purpose. The big benefit to obtaining public aircraft status is the public aircraft operator determines their own standards for the pilot, aircraft, maintenance, and aircraft, the maintenance of the aircraft and medical standards of the pilots, but they still must fly under 
Restrictions given to them by the FAA is listed in the Public Certificate of Authorization. Unfortunately, educators in schools are unable to fly unmanned aircraft under public COA for education. Keep in mind, many universities are flying under public COAs, but for purposes like aeronautical research, but not education. The FAA answered the question whether education was a governmental function in a letter from Mark Burry to the FAA's chief counsels, uh, from the from of the FAA's chief counsel's office to Jim Williams, who was in the UAS Integration Office, and they said, if the FAA uh, now were to read a concept as broad as education in the statute, it could exponentially expand the operation of unregulated aircraft. As a as a concept, education is not restricted to age or curriculum, and and, and would include aviation education such as flight schools. All manned flight, flight schools are civil operations and are subject to significant regulation. None use public aircraft to teach students to fly, nor would we allow uncertific uncertificated pilots operating on regulated aircraft to teach others. The same must hold true for UAS. As the statute contains no distinction and the type of aircraft used to conduct a public aircraft operation. Accordingly, I must answer in the negative your question of whether the university could, in essence, conduct a UAS flight school using its COA. You also ask whether some limited form of education could be found governmental. It would not be defensible to include education as a governmental function, but then draw artificial limits on its scope, such as the level of education being provided, the curriculum, or the aircraft that can be used. Since our agency mission is the safe operation of the national airspace, including the safe integration of UAS into it, any analysis of whether the list of governmental functions can reasonably be expanded to include education must contain a clear consideration of the overall effect that such a change would have on aviation as a whole. There is nothing in the law or its minimal legislative history to suggest that Congress intended education to be a governmental function that a state needs to carry on its own business free of aviation safety regulations. Let's go to the next option for educators since public uh, aircraft operations are not, uh, not going to be beneficial or not going to really be allowed for educational purposes. So the Section 3 through 3 exemption. Section 3-3 of the FAA Modernization Reform Act of 2012 says, uh, B, assessment of unmanned aircraft systems. In making the determination under subsection A, the secretary shall determine at a minimum, one, which types of unmanned aircraft systems, if any, as a result of their size, weight, speed, operational capability, proximity to airports and populated areas, and operation within visual line of sight do not create a hazard to user to users of the national airspace system or the public or pose a threat to national security. And two, whether a certificate of waiver, certificate of authorization, or airworthiness certification under Section 44704 of Title 49, United States Code, is required for the operation of unmanned aircraft systems identified under Paragraph 1. This authority given to the FAA was created before Part 107 or Part 101 were created. The FAA's view at the time was that all the FARs applied to civil aircraft. These regulations were very burdensome to comply with. For example, 14 CFR 119 requires the aircraft to be at least 500 feet from non-participating people and property, which makes it very hard to do aerial photography from 500 feet. The FAA was given authority under Section 333, but needed another legal tool to help the drone operator uh, drone operators get airborne. The FAA used the authority given to them in section 3 to determine that the unmanned aircraft did not need an airworthiness certificate, the remaining regulations were taken care of by using the Part 11 exemption process. This is why the paperwork allowing you to fly was nicknamed the 3 exemption. Even though section 3 does not provide any uh, exemption powers to the FAA, the operator operates under all the federal aviation regulations except for those specifically exempted. Where exempted, the operator flies according to the restrictions, which will provide an equivalent level of safety as the regulations they were exempted from. The FAA wisely decided to create restrictions in the 333 exemption, which required the pilot and command to determine the airworthiness of the aircraft and determine proper maintenance. However, all the pilots were still required to have a sport pilot license or higher, a driver's license or third-class medical, and they were still limited to Part 91 and its restrictions regarding their operation. Exemptions are operation-specific. The FAA's, I mean, the, the first group of Exemptions were for the cinematography industry, which was focused on creating mo uh, movies, not on instructing or education. The restrictions slowly morphed over time to be a a okay enough type of you know situation to allow for other industries to use the three through three exemption. Over a year after the first exemptions were granted on November twenty fourth, two thousand fifteen, the FAA finally granted a section three through three exemption to Kansas State University to allow for flight instructing. The FAA issued their educational memo on May 4, 2016, and 
Part 107 was released on June 21st, 2016, which is far easier to operate under than the Section 333 exemption. The idea behind the memo was to allow people to operate to fly for purposes of education without having to obtain a Section 333 exemption. To further promote flight training, the FAA granted on November 14, 2016, an amendment to a giant list of exemptions to allow many exemptions to conduct uh, uh, training of students. Three, the FAA's memo on educational, educational use of drones in Part 101 recreational operations. The background to Part 101, Subpart E. Up until Part 101, Subpart E went into effect, the FAA was pretty much echoing the definition of model aircraft as defined in Section 336 of the FAA Modernization Reform Act of 2012. Subpart 101, uh, uh, yeah, Part 101, Subpart E is just a copy-paste, really, of Section 336. Keep in mind that the terms model aircraft and recreational are used interchangeably throughout the FAA's website and material, even though recreational aircraft might not be miniature model versions of a full-size manned aircraft. You know, for example, Phantom 4, there's no big version of that, while there would be a bigger version of like a model P-51 Mustang. The FAA's treatment of a Section 336 is really weird because the FAA uses Section 336 to somehow define model aircraft, but Section 33 was actually specifically directed at the FAA telling them what not to regulate. The FAA ignored what Congress said in Section 336 twice. Once when the FAA created the new Part 48 registration regulations, and secondly, when they created Part 101, Subpart, 8 for, uh, subpart E, for a much more in-depth discussion, you can read my article on why the registration requirements and regulations are illegal. The reason I have question marks all over these, artic uh, th these different areas here is that the newly created Part 48 regulations and the FAA's interpretation that all aircraft are required to be registered, uh, all those things are actually being challenged in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. And how that court deter uh, like rules will determine the effect of the FAA's interpretations, Part 101 and Part 107, all model aircraft operations. And so the FAA's kind of spoken to these issues, and the, that case will give us great clarity as to uh, certain some of those standards going forward. So... Educational memo. The, re the reason why the educational memo was created was that many universities were wanting to offer classes where students would be required to fly the aircraft. This brought up questions such as, does the university need a Section 330 exemption, or does the student need a pilot's license? There are all sorts of spin-off questions such as, can we teach the local 4-H, Boy Scouts, etc. about drones? The FA summed the memo up in three points. A person may operate an unmanned aircraft for hobby or recreation in accordance with Section 336, of the FAA Modernization Reform Act of 2012. At educational institutions, community-sponsored events provided that the person is one, not compensated, or two, any compensation received is neither directly or incidentally related to the person's operation of the aircraft at such events. A student may conduct model aircraft operations in accordance with Section 336 of the FMRA in furtherance of his or her aviation-related education at an accredited educational institution. Faculty teaching aviation-related courses at Accredited educational institutions may assist students who are operating a model aircraft under Section 336 and in common with a course that requires such operation, provided that the student maintains operational control of the model aircraft, such as the faculty member's manipulation of the model aircraft's controls is incidental and secondary to the students. E you know, for example, the faculty member steps in to regain control in the event the student begins to lose control to maybe term terminate flight, etc. Let's now get into... The three, uh, three definite these three areas that the FA discussed. So, UAS demonstrations. Hobbyists or enthusiasts can fly at an accredited educational institution or other community-sponsored event to promote the safe use of UAS and encourage students' interest in aviation as a hobby, or for recreational purposes, provided the hobbyist receives no compensation of any kind, or honorarium or reimbursement of costs, or any such compensation either directly or indirectly furthers the hobbyist business. Of or, or operation of the U.S. And keep in mind, the last portion is very broad. If you think this might apply to you, the workaround is just to do demos inside a completely enclosed uh, building and avoid all of these legal gymnastic problems. Now, student use. We, you know, we were all wanting, wondering if uh, the skills learned from the education uh, somehow prevented the flight from being recreational. The FAA's interpretation of recreation was that the operator was not receiving any direct or indirect benefit. Skills would be an indirect benefit. So this kept many on the sidelines. The FAA went on to say that just because a student learns about the knowledge of flight does not make the flight not hobby and recreational when they will use the knowledge to get a degree. The link between knowledge to degree to job to j is, is just too attenuated uh, for the FAA to be considered outside of hobby or recreational use.
the FAA concluded that UAS flying for student flying for students at accredited educational institutions as a component of science, technology, aviation related education curricula or other coursework such as television or film production where the arts most more closely reflects and embodies the purpose of the hobby and recreation. If the student receives any reimbursement for costs or an honorarium, then that is not hobby and recreation. However, a student may receive financial aid, participating in a work study program, or being a paid research assistant to a faculty member teaching the course. Now let's get into faculty use. Faculty use. Uh, faculty teaching a course or curriculum that uses unmanned aircraft as a component of that course may provide limited assistance to students operating the unmanned aircraft. Without changing the student's hobby and recreational classification or the need for the faculty to obtain FAA authorization. This limited assistance exception is only where the, F the UAS operation is secondary to the course, uh, secondary in the course. However, if the UAS operation is primary, is the primary reason for the course, the faculty member would need authorization, but the student, as defined above, would not. It is not considered hobby and recreation for, faculty member, for a faculty member or assistant to operate a drone as part of their professional duties. Additionally, a professor cannot do a workaround to get the students to fly the drone for purposes of the faculty member's professional research objectives. So when does a university class operation not fall into this exception? Well, faculty operating the drone for research and development, faculty supervising students doing research and development using a drone, UAS flight instructing where the faculty is actively involved in the operation, where it's you know not incidental and secondary. However, just teaching without touching the controls would be fine. Think of it like the, the faculty uh, it is the air traffic controller teaching the student how to land the aircraft. Well, here, let's get into the, you know, the problems I see with this memo. So how much of this has been superseded or will be overruled? Does the newly created part one will nullify the older 336, uh, 336 interpretations? Will the FAA treat the 336 interpretations like they were really part 101 interpretations? How will the Taylor cases in the D.C. Circuit of Appeals cause problems to each of the interpretations on the 336 protected model aircraft class. Keep in mind the FAA mentioned in Part 107 in the Part 107 preamble that uh, they are revising the 2014 model aircraft interpretation. Must the aircraft uh, model aircraft be registered? Nothing is said in the memo about whether the aircraft must be registered or not. This is most likely an oversight of the FAA's part since they have been campaigning hard about the need for all aircraft 250 grams or above to be registered. The FAA's interpretation of Section 336 is that it prohibits the specific regulation of model aircraft, not the regulation of all aircraft as a whole, like it was some sort of special civil rights for drones equal protection clause, which does not in any way work with the meaning of special in the title of Section 336. In other words, how are model aircraft special, as indicated in the title of Section 336, if model aircraft are required to be treated like everyone else? Are model aircraft special or not? There is something seriously incongruous with the FAA's view of Section 336 and Part 101 and how Section 336 actually reads. The FAA seems to view 336 and now Part 101 as a, as a means of allowing model aircraft flights without authorization, when in reality it is specifically addressed at the FAA telling them to not create any rule or regulation governing model aircraft. FPV flying. The FAA, in their 2014 interpretation of the model aircraft rule, indicates that FPV racing would not fall within Section 336's definition of model aircraft. An interesting point here is that the, FAA, as the federal aviation regulations require the pilot to see and avoid other aircraft, and Section 336 which finds the model aircraft as being flown within visual line of sight of the person flying the aircraft. This all logically follows that the FAA's interpretation be that FPV racing, while per, uh, possibly permitted under the interpretation, would not be permitted under their model aircraft interpretation from 2014 since it would not be considered a model aircraft for purposes of Section 336 or really Part 101. So what does this all mean? There are more problems here than a MacGyver episode. There are just you know, there are really actually two easy solutions for educators in schools. One, have the students and teachers all fly indoors, or two, have the teacher uh, professor obtain a Part 107 remote pilot certificate and one of the students flies under direct supervision of the teacher professor. Part 107 is, a far less restrict, is far less restrictive than the newly amended Section 333 exemptions. So uh, let's get out into uh, Part 107, the non-recreational operations. The best choice is for the professor or teacher to obtain a remote pilot certificate. In-depth, step-by-step instructions are, are here. 
Uh, there are two options for attaining it. One, uh, manned aircraft pilots certificated in a Part 61 who are also current with a biannual flight review can take a free online training course. They then can get a deed from either a, a certified flight instructor, an a, uh, FAA aviation safety inspector, a designated pilot examiner, or an airman certification representative. They then file through an online portal. They'll receive an email later notifying them they can print out their temporary remote pilot certificate. Now, brand new pilots can take the remote pilot initial knowledge exam for $150 at a testing center. Also, manned pilots who are not current will have to take the knowledge exam as well. I have some articles here that would be very helpful for new uh, individuals to studying for the Part 107 or trying to find decent material for their classes. And now let's get into the important points about Part 107 for educators and schools. You know, please. Please understand this is not a complete list, but these are the major points that you that you should know. The minimum age of the remote piloting command is 16 years of age. Keep in mind that there is no limit how young a person who can be uh, who can be who is flying under the direct supervision of the uh, really teacher of the remote piloting command. <clears throat> Part 107 is for outside buildings while in the national airspace. You can get around the regulations by operating in a completely closed building. The FAA said on page 103 and 104 of the preamble to the final rule, to further enable the educational opportunities identified by the commoners, this rule will allow the remote pilot command, who will be a, certified, a certificated airman, to supervise another person's manipulation of small UAS flight controls. A person who receives this type of supervision from the remote pilot command will not be required to obtain a remote pilot certificate to manipulate the controls of a small UAS as long as the remote pilot command possesses the ability to immediately take control of the small unmanned aircraft. This ability is necessary to ensure that the remote pilot command can quickly address any mistakes that are made by an uncertificated person operating the flight controls before those mistakes create a safety hazard. The ability for the remote pilot command to immediately take over the flight controls could be achieved by using a number of different methods. For example, the operation could involve a buddy box system that uses two control stations, one for the person manipulating the flight controls, and one for the remote piloting command that allows the remote piloting command to override the other control station and immediately take direct control of the small unmanned aircraft. Another method could involve the remote piloting command standing close enough to the person manipulating the flight control so as to be able to physically take over the controls, the, the control station from the person. A third method can employ a use of an, auto, an automation system whereby this, the remote piloting command could immediately engage the system to put the small unmanned aircraft in a pre-programmed safe mode, such as and hover in a holding pattern and return to home. Let's jump into the potential liability issues that instructors and schools face. Instructors and schools face liability issues from multiple areas. Please understand this is also not a complete list. You should talk to an attorney to find out what applies to your local situation. State and local issues. All sorts of states, towns, and counties have started creating drone laws. It's becoming very problematic to keep track of them since they're spraying up like mushrooms. It's almost as if the drone laws are like some sort of like fad for government officials like Pokemon, and we are all now drone operators trying to catch them all. Here's two resources that you would find very helpful for trying to find your state laws regarding drones. Now, regarding city, county, town laws, good luck. You're on your own there. This is a big problem for the industry because there is no easy way to track the laws. The databases aren't complete, and these local governments are all wanting to play FAA, and they use all sorts of different terms, drones, UAS, I'm an aircraft, model aircraft, model airplanes. You end up having to search for a bunch of uh, different terms and hope one gets a hit. Otherwise, you're stuck in the land of uncertainty, wondering if you didn't find the drone law out there or there aren't any. The reason I bring this up is that the states, uh, the state laws have criminal penalties and other liability issues. For example, Florida's law provides for a private right of action for an individual to sue the drone operator using a drone to gather data for of the person's property that was not on, uh, not be not able to be seen from eye level. So you make sure you check out the local laws. The FAA is not the only one trying to regulate drones. Another area of liability is the students versus the teachers. Let's say the student is flying the drone and the teacher isn't paying attention to the student. Bam, now the student injured himself. The teacher or another student, you know, now we're in trouble. Was the teacher proficient in instructing? Was there means to override the student's actions to prevent this? Is there insurance covering the teacher, the school, the student? Third area of liability is third-party bystanders uh, versus teachers now and later, you know, in the future. This area of liability can be broken down into current liability and residual type of liability. The current type of, ability, uh, li current type of liability would be the teacher and the student versus the third party uh, in the area at the time. Maybe a mom jogging with a baby stroller, the mailman, the old guy walking the dog. The more subtle and dangerous type of liability is the lingering residual type of liability that happens when you train many students. 
If you train 100 students, that is 100 reasons flying around to get you sued. If one of them crashes into someone, you could get brought into a lawsuit as a defendant under the idea that you provided negligent instruction to the student. Hopefully, you will have an insurance policy that will cover this. This is why myself and other flight instructors stopped instructing altogether because we don't want to have this lingering liability. You should also document the living daylights out of all the training you give to students. This will come in handy later on if there is a lawsuit. I created a drone operator logbook, which will be helpful for documenting training. Yes, it is a paper logbook, but that also means that you won't have battery, connectivity, firmware, iOS version, etc. problems. So in conclusion, <clears throat> this is an ever-evolving area of the law. On top of that, it is confusing. If you are setting up a program or currently are running one, you might want to consider working with an aviation attorney to help you navigate this area safely. Additionally, you might need waivers or authorizations for some of these operations. If you're needing any help in this area, contact me so we can get this program off the ground and soar into new heights of success by integrating drones to save time, money, and lives.